Welcome back to this episode of the Main Street Vegan Program. A couple of announcements before we proceed. First, I want to do a shout out to our wonderful sponsor, Compliment. And this is a terrific supplement company. These supplements are designed for vegans, by vegans. And we've got some great uh, dietitians, medical doctors. Matt Frazier, the No Meat Athlete, is part of that. So if you want to check out what they have, supplements designed for the way you eat, go to lovecompliment.com. And where it says discount code, if you decide to buy something, you can just put Main Street in all capital letters, and you'll save yourself some money. I take one of the formulations Compliment Plus every single day, and it seems to be working for me. I hope you'll like it too. Then the other announcement is something that I have been doing. I started kind of midway in January. You know, sometimes these things that we want to start January 1st don't start till a little bit later. That's fine. So every afternoon, 4.30 Eastern time, I go on Instagram and do a live in which I read from this book. And I know you're probably going to see it backwards if I hold it up for people watching on YouTube, but better backwards than not at all. It's called Younger by the Day. And this book I wrote, oh my goodness, way back in 2004. But it's a day book and every day has a little reading. And what is cool about doing it now is that there's, you know, quite a few years in between when I wrote this and now. And since we're talking about growing younger, you kind of get to hear from my middle age self and my older age self. And then I get to hear from you. And there's a lot of interaction and a lot of wonderful exchanges. So I do hope that you will want to be part of that. My Instagram is at Victoria Moran author. And if you want to join us live um, 430 Eastern, whatever time that is where you are. And what time it will be for my guest coming up is Pacific time. He is out there in the wonderful East Bay area of California, such a terrific place. And speaking of terrific, he has written a book. I know I'm always telling you to buy books. This one is different. This one is not about the ethics or the health or the environmental impact of meat as much as it is about the technology of how we're going to get away from meat so that we can have the ethics and the environmentalism and the health that we're all looking for. So Kartik Shekhar has a doctorate in chemical engineering from Northwestern University. His research career has spanned many topics related to the future of food, such as bioreactors, quantitative biology, biochemical engineering, and metabolism. I'm not sure I understand any of those. He currently works as a data scientist in the alternative food space in Berkeley and has written a nonfiction science technology book, After Meat. Welcome, Kartik. Thank you, Victoria. I'm so happy to be here. It is wonderful to hear you. I am not hearing you really well. And let me see if this is at my end, because I want to make sure everybody else hears you because you have a lot of great stuff to say. Could you be just a little bit closer to your mic? Absolutely. How about now? You know what? I'm still not hearing you very well. Okay. Let me try switching mics. Okay. How about now? Still no. You know hmm. what? I'm going to try. It may be at my end. Let me try without the headset. And we and all this can be cut out by our wonderful uh, engineers. I'm going to and go to built-in microphone. Built-in speaker. Okay. Now speak to me. How about now? Oh, now you're perfect. So it was all at my end and we'll just get that part cut out. So I'll just go back to welcome Kartik. Hi, Victoria. I'm happy to be here. Oh, it's wonderful, wonderful to have you. So give us a little bit of background. I mean, did you grow up vegetarian? How did this become an area of interest? Yeah, so I became vegetarian in college. So my mom's a lifelong vegetarian. And, you know, of course, she was very inspirational in my life. And in college, I sort of had the rationale that eating meat was bad for the environment. 
And then uh, I would say about 10 years later, someone pointed out that uh, in order to produce milk, a, you know, a heifer or a female cow has to con continually be pregnant. And uh, in order to be pregnant, you know, she often gives birth to a calf, which is effectively, you know, waste product to the dairy industry. And, you know, that's where, you know, veal steaks come from. So once I internalized that notion, it, it just became very apparent that I had to go vegan. And so, yeah, I decided to make a switch then. Wow, that's cool. So you have a very technological background. You're an engineer and you've brought that in to what you do to promote a plant-based living and, and a vegan world. So how is your approach different from probably most of the people that I would talk to on this program? Absolutely. So I think much of the vegan in animal rights world has done a terrific job emphasizing the environmental and ethical problems associated with animal agriculture. And so I decided to take a separate angle, which is the technological angle, and basically argue that animals are actually one of the most ludicrous ways to produce large quantity of goods. So to you know add some add, 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 add some more detail here, it takes a cow you know about a year to grow you know fully. A cow weighs about ninety percent of what she's fed, and she can't really be innovated upon that much better. And if you look at alternatives, you know something like you know plant based or microbial fermentation you can get much more out compared to a cow. So to put this in perspective, a cow-sized bioreactor that's running microbial fermentation could replace about 10,000 cows. That, that's pretty cool. And I saw a statistic that just last year, just what we have now in the beginning stages of all this innovation, Beyond Burger and Impossible alone saved some huge number of, of animals, which is stunning. Yes, yes, I think uh, I read it was about a million animals uh, you know, bet between the two of them, which is which is amazing. And you know, one uh, you know that also brings up another point, Victoria. And I'm glad you brought up Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat. So they spend a lot of time trying to really reproduce that meat experience. And one thing that I argue in After Meat is that we'll actually be able to have a better gastronomical experience in this new animal-free meat world. So we'll actually be able to do better in terms of taste, nutrition, and cost. And it's actually going to be a win-win for everyone. And mm. we'd, be, we'd be, you know, shooting ourselves in the foot for not trying to get to this future sooner. Absolutely. So I have a question based on the way that I eat and the way that a lot of people who listen to this podcast eat. We don't eat very much of the processed stuff. I mean, I can speak for myself I, I do eat, drink the soy milk, oat milk in the carton because I'm too lazy to make my own. And my husband does like a Beyond Burger every now and then. But otherwise, we eat vegetables, fruits, grains, beans, nuts, seeds. So two questions. One is, why do people not want to do that? I mean, it's so good for you. And then the other question is, let's just imagine in the great hypothetical world, that everybody wanted to eat that way. Are there enough vegetables in the world? Could we feed people on a whole food plant-based diet? Or is there also a kind of technology of supply, meaning that not only do people like these faux meats, et cetera, but we're gonna need them? Yeah, I'll start with your second question first, uh, just because I think it's easier to answer in transitions to the first question. Okay. So yes, the short answer is absolutely. We could entirely feed the world with a with a whole food diet. So one of my best friends, he actually has a paper where he calculated that if you took all the land that we reared animal agriculture on, you would only need about 10% of the land to feed the same sort of nutrient composition, you know, using things like legumes, grains, and and, uh, and et cetera, plant-based ingredients. So, and that's really to get the same amount of protein, macronutrients, so forth. Uh, and then, so more to the point about, you know, these processed faux meats. Uh, so I feel like I kind of bridge the two because I, I consider myself, you know, half junk food vegan. You know, I, I consider myself first and foremost an ethical vegan. And then, and then I do have, you know, whole food uh, elements in much of my diet. And I don't necessarily see that these faux meats are, you know, quote unquote, transition food. 
I think for a lot of people, you know, these, you, this is what they crave, you know? So to put this in perspective, something like 36% of the world has fast food at least once a day. Mm. So, so this is a significant number and significant amount of, you know, animal suffering. Mm. And so, you know, to me, you know, of course, like we'd want them to eat a healthy whole food diet, but if we can get them to eat, you know, faux meat in place of, you know, animal meat, I think that's still, you know, a pretty big win. Yes, I think so too. And so talk to me a little bit from your vantage point of why, why these animal foods have such a hold on people. Yeah, I, so I think my friends would, you know, say something, you know, to the effect of, you know, just, just for a taste, you know, it's also just been very normalized, you know, by, by, you know, culture and, you know, history. I think there's also a worry about nutrition, you know, so just getting enough protein and then also, you know, it's, you know, quote unquote natural, which, you know, of, of course is, is very debatable. Yeah. Fascinating. So let's look at this world after meat. Give us a description. Yeah. So I think what's really exciting about the world after meat is we don't know necessarily how it's going to play out. And, you know, so one thing I, I really emphasize is that when we, when we make technological innovations, often the replacement is of a different design compared to its predecessor. So an example I like to give is horses. So for the longest period of human history, horses was the main way to move people, move objects across land. And, uh, and it wasn't until we developed steam engines, engines in the 19th century that uh, we were able to actually look at replacing horses as, uh, as a transportation technology. And what replaced horses wasn't an animatronic horse. It was, it was uh, you know, a car, it was, it was motorcycles, it was things of very different design. And so in my view, we have, you know, a similar sort of trajectory with food. So the, you know, future, especially of, of, of the faux food world, I think is going to look, you know, you know, very foreign to, to what we can kind of conceive of now. It might be, you know, steaks that are fashioned with, uh, with uh, 3D printers, or it might be, you know, these, uh, these fungi steaks that get created in bioreactors and then get flown, to, flown into us, uh, you know, by drones. Uh, but one thing I am very con conclusive about is that animals have very little role in our you know, food production of the future, just because they're so technologically deficient. And can you explain that to us from a technological vantage point? I think that most of my listeners are certainly aware of the animal cruelty, aware of the land use and, and the tie-in with, with world hunger and the, the climate connection, but can you just give us an overall engineer's view of why this is just not gonna work? Absolutely. So a cow we use, you know, and we speak in humanity, not you and me, uh, Victoria, mm -hmm. personally, we use a cow as a bioreactor to produce, you know, many goods such as dairy, meat, clothing, biologics, medicine, so forth. And a defined bioreactor. Yeah. And a bioreactor, it's, um, you know, it sounds like a very, you know, alien concept, but all it is, is something that uses biochemistry to transform an input to an output. So in the case of a cow, you know, it's transforming the food, you know, to all these other goods that uh, animal agriculture reaps. And, uh, and so, for example, like a microbial bioreactor would be something like a, like a beer fermentator, where it's, where it's taking yeast, or sorry, where it's taking sugar and yeast, and the sugar coming from barley or wheat, and then transforming that into, you know, a fizzy alcoholic beverage. So, um, so I, I want to, you know, just, um, you know, hopefully ease uh, the listeners and, you know, by the term bioreactor there, it's, it's not anything, uh, you know, too intricate. And uh, yeah, so in classical chemical engineering, when we're looking at reactors or bioreactors, we have a variety of metrics that we can, you know, determine how well a bioreactor is performing. So some, some very intuitive ones are yield. So that's uh, how much output do you get versus what you put in. 
And for cows, this is, this is really terrible. So about, you know, 95% of what's fed to cows is, is quote unquote wasted. And then the, another, another useful metric is productivity or how fast a bear actor can run. And uh, for cows, this is also terrible because cows take a long time to grow. And uh, this ultimately comes down or, or why cows are so bad as bioreactors is because of just their inherent physics and biology. So a cow has a very sophisticated circulation system and you know, she has to purvey nutrients around her entire body in, or, in order to run the circulation system. You know, she needs a beating heart and uh, you know, she needs to breathe. And so for all of these functions, that's actually subtracting away from all these performance metrics. And you know, ultimately we can't actually improve on a cow. We actually just have to jettison a cow completely and turn to you know, plant-based or microbial fermentation. So this fermentation that you talk about, is that different from what people call lab-grown meat where we get a little DNA from an animal? Yes, yeah, so lab lab grown meat is a bit of a catch all. So there's a couple of uh, a couple of different category subcategories to it. So one is this uh, in vitro meat or cultured meat, where we take a stem cell from a cow, and that stem cell can be put into a bioreactor and grown into you know a steak, and you know it's quote unquote a one to one replacement to a a, a cow steak. Uh, another form of lab-grown meat is microbial fermentation. So corn, Q-U-O-R-N, mm -hmm. is a great example of this, where it's actually not anything from an animal. It's actually a naturally occurring microbe that creates uh, what's called a mycelium, which is this very protein-rich matrix that can be formed into, you know, quote, you know, quote unquote, uh, meat patties. Uh -huh. I think that's the system that they use to make one of the foods I feed my dog, Wild Earth. Yes, yes, uh, Wild Earth uses uh, koji. Uh, so koji is also a microbial fermentation process. Interesting. So, um, okay, so we're looking at this world. We've got all these different kinds of ways to get food that doesn't come from animals. What's that gonna make the world look like in terms of how life is for humans? Yes, yeah, so I think the good news is that there's just so many positive knock-on effects here. So um, Victoria, you alluded to the environmental and ethical costs of animal agriculture. And that's partly explained by the te technological issues. So because cows take you know, such a long time to grow, you know, we've, we've realized we can't actually improve on a cow-based uh, production process and just have to you know, monopolize much of the resources of planet Earth in order to do, you know, in, uh, in order to do especially, uh, you know, cow agriculture. So something like a 30 percent, like 30 percent of the ice free land on planet Earth is being used to feed animal agriculture. And if we had, if cows grew twice as fast, we would actually need, you know, probably about half of that land, you know, just to just to see how all these things connect. So if we switch to something like plant-based or microbial fermentation, you know, those things are, you know, range from a hundred to 10,000 times faster. Mm. So think about how much land we actually free up. And then, you know, think about how much, you know, forest we can rewild, you know, how many trees we can, you know, put back on the planet earth, just draw back oxygen or draw back in CO2 and, you know, turn the tide against climate change. So, so that's the first point. We're, we're going to have a cleaner earth just by you know, switching, to, switching away from animal agriculture. And then two, I, I don't like to shy away from this point. I think the alternative food you know, shies away too much from it, but you know, we can't you know, turn a blind eye to animal suffering. It's a huge problem. Uh, you know, I think you know, the environmental calamity of uh, animal agriculture is, is pronounced, but the, to me, the, the suffering aspect of animal agriculture is, is just, you know, colossal. And, uh, and yeah, I think we'll instill better moral values in people as, you know, the shift occurs. I think it will become increasingly obvious and societally obvious that, you know, it's just wrong to treat animals in this way, you know, whether or not they're dogs or cows. And you say something beautifully about that in your introduction. 
where you're talking about that this book is about technology and that's what you're going to focus on. But you also say something else that I just loved and I'll bet I can find it. Okay, you say, I suspect that once technology has allowed alternatives to outcompete animal products and or replace them, we'll societally militate against animal products just as we once did against child labor and lead paint. I love that idea. Of course, I feel like having been vegan for you know, 38 years that I've been trying to do this for a long time, but I also know that these innovative foods have done more than all of us working tirelessly since veganism has been a thing. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, what I am really hoping for is a tipping point where, you know, it just becomes so obvious that this future is going to be a win-win in every single way. And, you know, it was one of the reasons I was really motivated to write after me, because I really do want people to see it's going to be a win-win in every single facet that we, that, you know, any consumer would care about. And, and uh, furthermore, you know, I was also kind of inspired by, you know, other, you know, technology companies when it comes to, comes to like clean energy and clean tech, you know, so for example, like Tesla. So, so Tesla is probably right now, you know, the coolest uh, car manufacturer on the planet. I think ask any 20 something male <laughs> and, you know, they're probably going to answer that. And um, I, I don't think they would actually say anything about, you know, the, you know, the clean energy or, you know, the fact that it's EV or, or anything like that. I think they would just say it's a really cool car. And I think that's where we're going to get to, you know, with the alternative food movement. It's just going to be, you know, transitioning from, uh, you know, from, um, I think, I think I used the analogy of uh, coal technology to like solar, to, to, to solar energy. Like we're just, we're just going to want to do it. And you had some other great stats in here about the percentage of millennials. What, can you pull that right out of your head? Of course you can. I can. What's the percentage of millennials who are vegan or vegetarian? Yes, the, the percentage is around 25. Who That's consider, pretty yes. huge. Yes, for people under the age of 30, or between, I think it's 25 and 34, who consider themselves vegetarian or vegan. Yes. Wow. And I'll bet it's higher in the younger kids and the Gen Z's. I wow. think so too. Yeah. That is thrilling. So I know that you are in the alternative food space. So you're around a lot of people and you agree on all this, you know, and I certainly agree with you to the degree that I understand the technology and otherwise I just have to trust you, but you probably know other techie people out there in California. I mean, What's the response to people who still eat meat? Do, do they see like other ways to work around these problems? And, and, and if so, what, what are their points? What are their arguments? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think we, we sometimes focus a little too much on the number of vegetarians and vegans. So, you know, a lot of my grad school friends actually read After Meat who, you know, still eat meat. And I think they would say that they've drastically cut down the amount of meat that they consume. And, you know, basically now, you know, only do it for, you know, special occasions such as, you know, weddings or, or, or you know, holidays. Uh, and I have seen, you know, more receptivity, you know, to the idea that, you know, we can technologically innovate our well, ourselves to a more exciting world of food. And, you know, a lot of cheerleading and, you know, a lot of openness to trying, you know, just new products when they come out, you know, so uh, I think like the KFC uh, plant-based chicken nuggets that came out in the past month have, you know, you know, are a great example, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uh, chatter from my meat eating friends about them too. Uh, and, you know, I recently Impossible Foods came out with some uh, vegan nuggets that I, that I really like. So, so, and as I understand it, for most of the alternative foods, the biggest consumers are actually not vegans or vegetarians. It's actually the quote unquote flexitarians. So something like 95% of the sales for these alternative food products are actually going to these, uh, to these flexitarians. Well, God bless them. <laughs> and let's hope they just keep moving on over. Uh, the book, everybody, is After Meat. 
The Case for an Amazing Meat-Free World by Kartik Shaker. PhD, I don't think we got your PhD in there earlier. So in our last couple of minutes, what, what do we do to help bring this into being? How can we live our lives each day to uh, create this world after meat? Yes, so in my view, we have to get to that tipping point where, you know, it's just, you know, this future is just so obvious. We're just trying to get there as quickly as possible. And so trying to get as many people to see it and to be excited about it. And so uh, one way is I think just being able to reduce the animal agriculture subsidies. So I think this makes it really, really hard to technologically innovate ourselves to these, to these new foods. So right now, animal uh, agriculture subsidies make meat and animal products about 25 to 30% cheaper than they would be in a fair market. Uh, the second thing I would like to see is, I would actually like to see just more governments, you know, just, just funding such efforts. So right now, it's mostly just the private industry, like Silicon Valley, you know, you know, you know just doing private funding to, you know, to do these uh, innovations. And that's not what we really want. We, we want um, you know, some of these innovations to be in the public domain. We want academic labs to be working on it. And you know, in my view, clean food has the same magnitude of impact in terms of you know, benefit as clean energy. So if you think that governments should be spending billions of dollars on clean energy, then we should also be spending billions of dollars on, on clean food. And so I, I hope uh, you know, I can inspire more advocacy on that end. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I hadn't thought about it. You know, there's money going to do something good, but then there's money going that, that negates, you know, what was just done. Very, very interesting. So everybody, the book, it's After Meat. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it wherever you buy books. The website is aftermeatbook.com. Com, and um, you can find Kartik on a LinkedIn, and I'll just put that info in the show notes at MainStreetVegan.net. And I want to do a couple of shout outs, one to our mutual friend, Jill Frazier of Jill Milan fabulous luxury vegan handbags. You've got to check them out if you don't know them already. And also uh, Marla Rose and uh, the good people at Chicago Vegan Mania and Vegan Street for your fabulous vegan rock star t-shirt. So I don't know how you guys are listening today, but there is a new way to, to get this podcast, and that is that you can actually watch it and see my guest and me on YouTube, and that would be my YouTube channel, Victoria Moran NYC. So thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks to Unity Online Radio for coming up on 10 years of uh, hosting the Main Street Vegan program, and to each and every one of you, God bless your veggies and maybe some alternative meats to take good care. <laughs>